Welcome to the Executive Lounge with me in Chirado. This is the business thought leadership program that brings you the insights and uh, nuggets of wisdom from the experiences of men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of uh, starting, growing, managing, and uh, essentially building businesses uh, both here in Ghana and across the world. My guest today is a uh, man who spent a lot of his uh, working life as a uh, banker. Uh, but has had some experiences which he will be bringing to bear on this conversation today. He is Mr. Olalika Sanusi, the Managing Director and CEO of Guarantee Trust Bank Ghana Limited. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you so much, Isra. I see um, you prefer to be called uh, Lekan. Um, tell us what Olalika means. Well, literally live within Yoruba's um, culture. Olalika is my wealth has increased by one. Mm. So children are regarded as wealth. And those, I mean, even up till now. Mm -hmm. So, where well, Alalico means my wealth has increased by one. Okay, well, that's a good name Literally. to have. That's right. And I'm sure you are a wealth of blessing to the family as well. Oh, very much. Yeah. Very much to the extent that um, in the last 52 years, it's been um, a success story. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. And 52 years this year. Mm -hmm. And um, things have been very good, thanks to God who has made all of that possible. Wonderful. Now, tell us a bit about your family there. <laughs> Well, um, I now have my own family, but I came from a family of um, a polygamous family, for that matter, within the Nigerian setting, in the southwest of Nigeria. Mm. Okay, um, I have thought of um, about eight or ten children, mm -hmm. from my dad and my mom and other wives. Life was good when we were growing up. Um, you have your parents around you, and of course the whole village, the whole town, is, um, takes care of you, because they see you as... The child of um, everybody. That is that is the way we grew up in, uh -huh. that, in, that, in that community. And of course, it's a relatively small town in the southwest part of Nigeria. Well, the, the world we knew then when we were growing up in the 60s was um, that town and maybe Lagos. Lagos was like little London uh -huh. that everybody would prefer to, to go. Where I was born is about um, 70 kilometers of, um, away from Lagos. And then that, that takes about, about an hour because of traffic to, to get to. But of course, growing up, a lot of things came across mm. immediately within the community. Of, because, because of its Muslim background, religion, um, the first thing is to have the fear of God. You have to make sure you stop God. Mm -hmm. God is omnipotent, is omnipresent, and um, it's, it's supreme, which, is, which I think is a big good thing a child must imbibe. Then the next discipline. So if you are not disciplining the next the neighbor, a neighbor can discipline you. It's that's the way the community from discipline is quite important because it, it, it engenders self-control. Uh -huh. Apart from self-control, discipline is what will also not make you take what does not belong to you. It's, it's part of self-control. Right. So it 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 it, it on, on discipline you bring out integrity, you bring out honesty. You bring out so many things because it means your ability to know that this thing is not right mm -hmm. and I won't do it. Or I'm doing this thing, there is a limit and I should stop. And of course, both fear of God and discipline will not produce success on their own. There must be element of hard work. Mm -hmm. And I realized that very early in life. One thing that also drove those three things is the desire to, be, to excel in mm -hmm. whatever I do. And because of that, you have to work very hard to be able to be outstanding either in, in whatever field you, you find yourself. And those three core values, the fear of God, uh -huh. discipline, and extreme hard work, uh -huh. not just hard work, but extreme hard work, they all combine together to make the man that is seated before you. Well, and um, obviously that along the way helped you also excel when you went to uh, Ogun State uh, University. University, which is where you got your I first you uh, degree. My first degree yes. Okay. Tell us about, you know, your education, life from the village going to university and all that. For those who know Ogun who know Nigeria very well, I'm born buttered and bred in Ogun State of Nigeria. I had my elementary school in um, Ogun State in, in the Peru, my southwest of Nigeria. But one thing I could remember, I recollect very well was I started, I started school very early. Uh, I maybe when I was about four years old. In those days, when we say very early, I mean, today a two-year-old child is probably at school. Uh -huh. But in those days, you don't get to school until when you are six. 
And typically, there will also be a test. Uh -huh. Because most people in those days would not even know their date of their birth date. They don't have records. So they will do a test for you, asking you to stretch your hand. And if your hand could not touch, for those who, are sh who were short, <laughs> whose hand could not touch the air, definitely you, you, you won't start school. But, uh, but I, think, I, I think I had an, a problem of loneliness because my, my, my older siblings would go to school and I'd be the only one back home. Uh -huh. And of course, I wanted to know what, what were they doing? What, what, what were they doing in that, um, in that school? So on a particular day, I refused. I said, well, definitely I have to be in school. Well, my mom, out of annoyance, took me and said, well, you've been bothering me, so let's go. We got to the school. The school teacher said, this guy, this boy is just too small to start school. But the, my mother says, she, he, won't, she won't, allow, he won't allow me to rest. Okay, in any case, whichever way it goes, we don't have space. My mom says, I'll bring a bench where this boy will sit if I could only have peace at home. <laughs> now, something definitely must have been urging me and pushing me because I think education was just, I just consider education as very important mm -hmm. in life. I started school, finished, and then went to secondary school, also in Ogun State. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I realized that hard work in education is so essential very early. I knew that I was relatively brilliant. You come to maybe first, first to third, you come out. But you, do, you do not care. In elementary school, then you go to secondary school, until I got to the university. Mm -hmm. At the university, it dawned on me that extreme hard work can actually produce an outstanding result. So I was fortunate to make a first class. And that was probably what became the bedrock of what you can say today that we have achieved. But so far, so good. After my first degree, the desire was to, my primary desire was to be a lecturer, to just be a teacher and impart, impart knowledge. And unfortunately, my university also offered me the opportunity after my first degree to be. But while I was doing my first degree, the BSc in economics, I realized I had special interest in what you can regard as monetary economics, mm -hmm. which is the aspect that deals with banking and finance and then general money. I mean, money is good to have. Mm -hmm. So I picked so much interest in that area. And after I finished, even though I was offered the opportunity to be a teacher in school, um, somehow, somewhere, I got into a non-bank financial institution in, in Nigeria. That was around 1989, 1990. I got into this non-bank financial institution. And within a very short while, I think my skills got recognized. But I knew that I would need to operate at the higher level, mm. at the highest level in the, in the profession. So I got a scholarship, and I went to University of Sheffield, where I did the master's in banking and finance. And I made a distinction in that program. On, on that program. I left, I think I left Sheffield in 1997. Then I returned back to Nigeria. But before I went to Sheffield in 1996, I was already a banker. Mm -hmm. I was working for, I worked for quite a number of banks. I worked for City Trust Merchant Bank. I worked for, for Shonic Bank. Then eventually I joined Guarantee Trust Bank in 1995. Mm -hmm. Then got this um, offer of scholarship in 1996. But Guarantee Trust Bank was very kind then to me because the CEO then called me and said, well, you will go for your program if you think you still want to work for us when you are back, the opportunity is available. And that's very, very, that has been very helpful, particularly looking at the level of unemployment in Nigeria then. And of course, the fact that he probably was able to identify a talent and was ready to nurture that talent. So I returned in 1997 back to Guarantee Trust Bank. So far, so good to so have a first degree, then I have a master's degree in banking and finance. I think that's my education. That's interesting. I mean, you talked about the fact that, you know, you believed early on uh, that hard work pays, but more importantly, that getting to the university, uh, as the stack of work increased, your desire to even work harder also increased. Um, is that something that you find today, culturally, especially with your experience across the sub-region that we have imbibed in uh, today's generation? I think when people talk, which is somehow I disagree, people, people always look at the past and tend to think that the past is, whatever happened in the past is far, far better than what was. So in Guarantee Trust Bank, for instance, first, I mean, entry-level staff, will have to see the CEO before they become part of, um, before they are offered employment. And get coming across some of, some of the people I've interviewed, young university graduates, you could see that there are a lot of promising talents still much around who believe that hard work 
is the only route, more or less the only route through which they can climb the ladder of um, success. Mm -hmm. They believe in discipline and they also have the fear of God, which are some of the values. They, have, they show say, some level of, you see honesty and sincerity, sincerity in them. I've seen that in Ghana. While I was in Nigeria, I was privileged to also interview some young upcoming graduates, and you could see that they also have so, those, those set of attributes. Some of them will even, after, at the end of the interview process, they have an opportunity to also ask me questions, and some of them will want to know what are the, what are the secrets, what are the tricks. They will ask very intelligent questions. I think we are blessed along the west coast of um, Africa with very young, intelligent people who make difference in the future. The only thing we need to do, both at the public and the private sector, is to create the enabling, enabling environment mm. for people to thrive. Even in Gambia, where I also introduced the graduate recruitment scheme, when I started running Gambia from 2006, I introduced the graduate recruitment scheme. Then the graduates of the University of the Gambia, they were just coming out, and we were privileged to be one of the few institutions who could go to the university directly to recruit. And you could see very promising and talented. Some of them today are already at the middle level in the, in the career stream, and they are doing very well. And some of those that we nurtured, one of some of them, some of them that I nurtured, are already running banks. There is a particular, there is a lady who worked with me in Gambia. She's currently running a bank in Sierra Leone. When you see some of those things, you will realize that West Africa is blessed. We should, I think, in my own personal view, yes, the colonial heritage, the history of the past, could have had an impact in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But I think so far so good. We have crossed the Rubicon as set of individuals in West Africa and in Africa in general. What we should therefore be doing is to see how serious we, 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 we can in managing our resources and in probably telling the West that you know what, we can put our acts together. Mm. You know, if you would look back at the sub-region, our traditional history, the essence of communalism has always been prevalent. Sure. Um, quite a lot of people talk about it not being present today and that we're becoming very uh, insular and more about our nuclear family. How difficult does that make the ability to spot and nurture people and, and that they become submissive enough to learn from other people um, in your experience? If you, if you, look, if you look critically, you will realize that even though people tend to think that there is a, a, a fundamental change in the societal structure, mm -hmm. if you actually interact, which I believe you do, with the spectrum in society, you realize that the change is not particularly fundamental. Mm -hmm. You still have the likes of people like me, for instance, who didn't grow up in Lagos, who grew up in a town outside Lagos. And you, I, I, when I, like I said, when I interview people, I, I discover that Somebody will mention a village, you actually be looking for it on a map. And this is a guy who went to a primary school in that village, probably a secondary school within that vicinity, end up in University of Ghana, and he makes, he ma he makes a first class. Ends up in University of Kwame Nkrumah, University of um, Science and Technology, and makes a first class. A raw, we, we have a lot of raw talent in, in our society mm -hmm. that we need to actually identify, harness, and develop. If you enter a compound in Gambia and it's lunch time, you must join in having lunch. Okay? One could say, okay, in some major developed cities, it's not, it's not necessarily that way. What has influenced that thought is the changes we have seen in the cities where, where individuality has probably is not predominating. Mm. And what is driving the individuality is the emergence of gadgets. You enter a family, you see a father playing on iPad, a mother on phone, children on whatever. Mm -hmm. In any case, at the end of the day, communication is going on. The only difference is it's not going on verbally. They are exchange, either talking to among themselves or talking to people outside. Again, information dissemination has become so fast in today's world. It still has not taken away the fact that that is my uncle, mm -hmm. that is my cousin, and that is my nephew within the um, African definition. And even a, a particular person who is not particularly your own blood, mm -hmm. his brother, because you believe that, okay, 
we live on the same street. It's been very nice to me. So he said, brother. I know that some people will argue that, oh, things have changed so far. When we were growing up, is it comparing when we were growing up with modern day world, it would be like comparing Fanta and Coke. They are two different, they are two different things because the setting then was particularly different. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding, I still believe within African setup, our communalism is still intact. So with the advent of technology, I mean, we'll talk about innovation in the banking sector, for example, but more for cultural cohesion and societal uh, cohesion. Can technology help us be better? It's actually helping us to be better because whichever part of the globe I am any day, I speak to my wife. And I had known that with that technology, I would not have been able to. When my son was doing his A-levels in the UK, it's, a man it's mandatory for him to call me at a particular time of the day, each day. And I'm, so I'm able to feel him. I'm able to hear his voice. And with technology also, I can do FaceTime with him. I can see him. I can do it. I can do that. So technology is rather um, a catalyst in communication and communal cohesion rather than something that is... Big. The only thing I've seen, so far so good, it has, it has also altered the behavior of certain people. Certain people have more or less become me to myself. But that me to myself does not mean that they are not communicating. They may not be communicating in a traditional sense, where we probably sit at, stand at one side of the village and mm -hmm. shout to the next man. <laughs> at the next, at the, that was the technology that was available there. Right. That was all that technology. Mm -hmm. That was all thing you could do, other than to scream and shout and, and then laugh hilariously. But even um, sending text messages, send jokes, mm -hmm. send um, hilarious things, even on the thing you use um, symbols to show laughter, to show this to other. So far, so good. I think within the African setup, I still so much believe. There are some people that I, I speak to today, not necessarily because, and I speak to them practically every other time, not only because we are related blood in the, in the sense, mm -hmm. but because when I was growing up, they were just there. Mm -hmm. They were the brother on the next street or the sister on the next street. And over time, if you ask me, I'll tell you it's a, it's a cousin. It's, it's neither a cousin nor an uncle. But it's just because the fact that in the African setting, even though with the advent of technology, that bonding is still being maintained. Well, good to know. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to learn a lot more from uh, uh, Mr. Lekan Sanusi, the CEO and Managing Director of Guarantee Trust Bank. This is the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado. We'll be back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shira Addo and my guest, Mr. Lekan Sanusi, CEO and Managing Director of Guarantee Trust Bank Ghana Limited. Now, before we went on that break, uh, we had learned quite a lot of things, uh, including the three uh, cornerstones of his life, right? extreme hard work, discipline, and the fear of God will certainly set you in a good stead. But also, we talked a bit about technology and how that is rather a catalyst and a distraction. Now, let's find out a little more about technology and innovation in the banking sector. Um, you've done quite a number of things. And in fact, recently you've uh, launched, I think is my, my GHP, um, which is a, a groundbreaking innovation. Sure. Uh, how do you come by these ideas? Isha, you know, we're all members of this society. I'm a, I'm a customer of a bank as much as you are a customer of a bank. And the only thing I need to continue to do, because that's my job, mm -hmm. is to begin to ask myself, what convenience am I still looking for? Or how, uh, how do I still want my bank to do things so th such that convenience can be elongated? Or more importantly, of course, we all bank with, we are all customers of banks abroad. I mean, you travel out, you enter a branch of a bank, you want to see how things are done, you know, because you believe that you can always steal ideas. Mm -hmm. And of course, maybe I sit down here in Accra, I'm able to do all my banking transactions with my, in my, with my offshore, offshore bank, I'm able to do all my banking trans transactions conveniently without talking to anybody. I can't remember the last time I entered the banking hall of Barclays Bank UK. So you, some of these ideas, therefore, you either take them, from, or you also, as an individual, you challenge yourself. Of, of, of what value is it I need to pay like two or three or four different institutions and 
I know I can create value by putting all those institutions on the same platform. That is how my GHP.com came up, for instance. We just realized that, okay, as an individual, let's assume I have a ward, a child at University of um, Ghana. I have one at Ken UST and maybe at Shesi University. And then I need to buy, I need to top up my credit. Then maybe I need to um, do internet bundle. I just realized that, okay, if I need to do all of this, there are several options. One of them is to go onto the road and maybe buy a scratch card and begin to scratch it. The other one is then to go to the cash office or go to a branch of a bank and go and pay mm -hmm. my children's school fees. We thought, okay, wait, why don't, since we, have a, we, since we have an arrangement with these institutions to collect fees on their behalf online, mm -hmm. why don't we put all of them on the same platform, internet, web page? So if you then click www.mygHP.com, it throws out all these merchants for you. And once these merchants are thrown, you can just begin to do all your transactions in one fell swoop. I mean, it might just be, maybe you just, it may be a 9 p.m. or a 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. of the night, and that is the time you actually have the opportunity to do those transactions. Then you, at the same time, you probably realize, okay, I'm going to Kumasi tomorrow, and I need to buy an airline ticket. Hey, it's late. How, what do I do? Ah, will I go to the airport tomorrow? No, I don't need to do that. On my GHP.com, you will see um, Africa World Airline. You see Stabu, and then you click on it. You book your ticket. You make your payment. Oh, no, no, no. My money is actually in my mobile wallet. Oh, and these people could only accept Visa card or MasterCard. My GHP will enable you to take money from your mobile wallet and you can make the payment. The thinking has not stopped. It hasn't because you have to continue to elongate. I kept on, I kept on telling my officers that it's an endless journey mm -hmm. we are in. The only thing we ought to, we should do as individuals with technology, make sure we play our best, do our best, and then leave the rest for the next generation. Some people in the past have done what they could do. Mm -hmm. The first time I entered Barclays Bank in the UK years ago, and they gave me, um, I was able to lodge money, mm -hmm. sleep-free banking. This is, this is, this is, this is, wow. Sleep-free banking is today given. And as soon as I made the lodgement, I got a notice, a notification on my phone. You have just made a lodgement of so much in your phone, on, on your account. If it has been the reverse, if somebody has probably unauthorized debit into my account, I will receive a notice mm -hmm. instantly. Those are basic convenience. In the past, what do we have? We used to have, you have to wait till the end of the month to it's receive it. Uh, uh, statement in the postal box. By the time you are getting the statement, maybe <laughs> the money has been taken weeks before then, That's and right. then you begin to go to the bank, or okay, maybe it was even a wrong debit. Anyway, that is the way we in Guarantee Trust Bank, we look at. And it's not, it's not us alone, I mean a good banker under the current dispensation, should begin to look at technology as an enabler. The thing is here to stay. The only thing you can begin to ask yourself is, how can I use this thing? Tell, let us say it's greed, we want to make more money, mm -hmm. but the other bit of it, the other side of the coin is, we want to place, put convenience at the doorstep of the customers. Well, money is a byproduct of a job well done. So Thank you so much. If you're fixing customer problems and you're getting paid for it, then exactly. all the better. Exactly. So what are the key elements that you will fall on to anticipate what um, the customer might want tomorrow in order to be able to provide that innovation? If I ask you a question now, Ishura, that let us assume that you find yourself, you need to travel urgently, you need to go to Kumasi urgently, and you could approach an automatic teller machine, and you could buy an air ticket. Won't you like it? Of course. That is the game. Okay, I, I called my officers one day and I challenged them. They said, how did you think about that? You have to think about circumstances that people can find themselves. In the past, not too recent, in the recent past, if you approach somebody that you need money, the only thing you tell her, see me tomorrow, mm -hmm. my bank has closed. But today, bank, bank is opened 24 hours. A particular thing is also need to drive bankers. Mm -hmm. It's a major development. They are, they are what we now call disruptors. Fintech companies, mm -hmm. telcos, they are all rendering banking. Whether you like it or not, they are rendering banking services. If a telco says, borrow me credit, lend me credit, it's giving a loan. Mm -hmm. It's granting a facility to a customer. 
So if a banker is not careful, therefore, that retail customer you are still waiting for to give a facility to is already borrowing credit. And so if he's able to borrow credit, the only thing he will do is to pay when he collects his salary. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is done. So bankers, therefore, need to stand up and say, okay, wait, before you take over my job, I need to have something to also offer. I know you do mobile money. Let me then make sure I integrate with you so that both of us are symbiotic for the benefit of that same mm. customer. After all, the same individual is the one that is in, that is banking and is one that's also carrying GSM, is one that's also having mobile mobile wallet. Now, banking, if if we begin to go in the direction of individuals alone, we are probably getting too narrow. Mm -hmm. The corporate the corporate treasurer is also there, who is also looking for convenience. So there are so many things that in the past will have been done with a lot of difficulty can easily be done. A lot of the packages we give to our customers, for instance, come with a reconciliation package mm -hmm. at the back of it. And reconciliation of accounts is a major headache for most corporate treasurers. So once you are delivering maybe a GTP, that's the online collection platform for a customer, and you are putting a reconciliation package such that he can drop, he, he can download the reports of the accounts and then make the what, what he has downloaded to be able to talk to his own software, integrate to his own software, a majority and bulk of his headache is gone. Today, we have signatories to account, corporate accounts. They are so mobile. They move from one place to another. Mm -hmm. We have peculiar accounts where the authorized signatories, some of them are in Ghana, some are in New York, some are in UK. But all these people, they have to run the account. They are recognized as signatories. Mm -hmm. How will they do it in the old past? Today, they can run the account very effectively and efficiently through what we call Guarantee Trust Bank Automated Payment System. And it's, it's an internet-based process wherein um, payment requests will go to them. They will provide the approval as if they have signed the check. And so the corporate treasurer is sitting down saying, wait a minute, I think life is good. I don't have to bother myself about so many things. Let me share, share, let me share um, an experience with you. When I started banking, when it's approaching month end, I used to be very well, very seriously scared because I was in operations. They were the days of ledger cards. Mm. Do you know what ledger cards are? Even you call a new entrant into a bank and say ledger card, the man would look at what's, okay, what's ledger card? <laughs> those, are, those are part of uh, part of history. Because at the end of each month, each customer has a ledger card. And we have to take each ledger card and bring it up to date. You have to update it. Manually calculate the savings account. Manually wow. calculate interest. And guess what? If you calculate interest and it's wrong, the customer will come back to you. You will see TPEX. And I'm, I'm not even sure TPEX do exist today. I'm not even sure Banner <laughs> Typewriter still exists. That is what technology has done to our lives. And personally, well, it's something I would encourage everybody to embrace. Now, quite interestingly, when GT Bank started operations in Ghana, I think you pioneered the uh, slip-free banking. Slip-free, yeah, sure. Um, and it was interesting. You know, you walk into the bank, whether you wanted to withdraw or, or pay well, money, yeah. you just gave your account number and you got a little piece of paper printed with everything. And then and you signed. It, sign, yeah. it was convenient. Sure. Um, over the time, what were the core values that the bank continues to hold which has made it possible for you to one attract the people who kind of feed into the thinking of keeping the customer centered uh, at all times and to continue to innovate when we when we transformed into the current brand which you see that was in the original brand mm -hmm. you know, of the guarantee trust bank and you see the very old brand that was that was a different story we 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 initiated what we what you call the orange rules. One of them is innovation. And when you come into the bank as an entry level staff, you are made to believe that you have to be think you have to be on your feet thinking 24 hours on what are the new things you can do. A good institution must continue to rejuvenate itself, mm -hmm. bringing new things. So that's what will continue to endear your customers to what they're always looking for to say what's the new thing, what's the latest that the institution will bring. The next one will be excellence. You want to make sure everything you do, you do it right for the first time. And you don't just come to the market and begin to make mistakes because it could damage reputation. Mm -hmm. the, what, you can also, what we also make sure we do is friendliness. We were the one of the, I think we were the first bank in Nigeria to remove tellers from cages. You know, in the past, I still do. I mean, some yeah. banks today, you still see tellers, they will put a cage, they will put a glass. Right. And then you see the customer 
trying to communicate with the teller. The teller could not hear. The yeah, and then you have to keep, and you know, you have keep ducking, on talking. Yeah. I mean, and then, okay, what was the objective? Okay, you want to protect the teller so that somebody will not collect the cash. If I'm robber, may God forbid, if I'm robber is going to attack anyway, they are not necessarily going to be looking at your teller points. Maybe they attack a bullion van. Or when they enter the banking or anyway, whether you like it, whether you are in a cage or anywhere, once you see gone, you surrender. So we felt that there must be that two-way thing okay. between the um, teller and the customer. And the customer. Mm -hmm. So we remove that cage. And so, so that must be that, that free flow. And when you also interact, you know in the past, we tend to have this mentality very much in the past that you are probably helping a customer. No. In fact, the reverse is what we look at in Grand Store, but that is the customer That's helping, that is rather you. helping the bank. Because mm. without the customer, I don't have a job. I'm the chief customer service officer. So service excellence, customer service, beaming with smile, talking to the customer, making him very comfortable to make sure that there's a repeat patronage from the customer is quite essential. It's evident that innovation is a big deal for Guarantee Trust Bank uh, because you pioneered the slippery banking uh, first in Ghana. Now, what are the key elements or the values you look for and, and the kinds of people that can ensure that you're constantly innovating and pleasing your customers? We, we are highly selective when we go through the recruitment um, process. One of the few things we look for in the people we recruit mm -hmm. is their, we take is a value judgment that they are going to be able to blend in within to the culture of, um, of the bank. But notwithstanding, after recruitment, we take them through training and we try to put our culture and our values mm -hmm. in, them, in those people. When you meet a typical guarantee trust bank person, within the banking space is unique because he relates with you in a particular way. And that particular way is to give you that preeminence, that importance to ascribe it to you as a stakeholder. More importantly, at, at the level of being a customer, the, the value we attach is, is, is extremely very, very high. Mm -hmm. And we extend that to everything we do. Even the way our branches are designed, the way they are located, is driven by the fact that we want it to be convenient for the customer. Um, if you get to a typical branch of Guarantee Trust Bank, a standard bank Guarantee Trust Bank, you will see people, commission, we call them commissioners, mm -hmm. but they are security guys, who ordinarily will assist you to navigate how to pack your car. Mm -hmm. Nothing is as bad as a customer coming to your premises, for instance, and knocking his car or his vehicle against something. Because at times, because of the space, space around, mm -hmm. you may need to actually, it might be a little, a little bit tight. So there's one man whose job, whose role is to ensure that you are navigated correctly. And in approaching the banking hall itself or the branch itself, you will see a ramp for the disabled to be sure that we don't know the kind of person that will come and then you could probably see steps that could take in the and of course, as soon as you enter the bank, before you get to the banking hall, there's another person you will see, dressed in white, who should be able to assist you almost immediately. Probably you are not, you, what you want to do is not to go to the banking hall, maybe you want to see an account officer. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody more of a receptionist, but more than a receptionist, who will guide you. The ultimate objective of doing all of that is to make sure that that touch, that experience is fulfilling. Mm -hmm. We also believe that customers have little or no time. Mm -hmm. And a bank is not a place where you should carry a mat to go to. You want to come into a bank, do your business, and then go and do your primary business that will yield more money to you. Mm -hmm. Not to use a lot of efforts to earn your money and then come to a bank and spend a lot of hours or efforts to either put the money in or get the money out. So if you are getting the money in or you are getting the money out, sleep free works. And as soon as you finish sleep free, we give you a notice that something has happened, either a debit or a credit. And a lot of other information will be push, pushing them to you on a regular basis to make sure that we keep you abreast. Meanwhile, at the engine room at the back, we are looking at several other products and services that will also continue to help 
to make sure that as a customer, because we believe that without the customer, there's no bank. Mm -hmm. Let's take that very, very clear. And I cannot imagine a typical guarantee trust bank that will be rude to a customer. No, it's, it's practically impossible. Not necessarily because the customer is always right, but because the customer needs guidance. Mm -hmm. He needs to be nurtured in his education. All right. Now, in the event that you may have the unfortunate situation where people are fully aligned, um, what are the processes you would take or how do you deal with getting people back in line to advance the, the, uh, uh, the vision? At, at the entry level, the first thing we do is a comprehensive training. We, the way we structure ourselves is such that we take in people at the entry level. And at that entry level, what we do is to make sure we get them to take them to the training school. They are in the training school for like one month or more where they are honed, where they are really trained on the values of the bank, apart from the general banking knowledge we they need to have. And on a regular basis, there are regular training. Feedback, you come back, and then people are watching you. Because behind each of the tellers you are saying, these are they, they are just the front desk. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people behind them who are actually watching how things are moving. And there's the management staff themselves who actually do management by walking around to ensure that those values are here to you. It's not very impossible. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not impossible mm -hmm. to see one or two one or two cases where there could be one or two things. But you just make sure you keep on pushing the barrier. Keep, I mean, keep, keep on pushing the frontier to draw meat. And an average human being, honestly, by the time you keep on telling him something once, twice, three times, or four times, and keep on saying there's what is called orange rules, these are the orange rules. Uh, simplicity, friendliness, innovation, excellence, and you keep on drumming it. An average individual will definitely fall in line. Wonderful. We're going to take a final break, and uh, we'll come back with more with my guest, Mr. Lekan Sanusi, CEO of Guarantee Trust Bank Ghana. This is the Executive Lounge, and we'll be back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado and my guest, Mr. Lekan Sanusi, CEO of Guarantee Trust Bank Ghana Limited. Now we're in the back straight of our conversation and there's still a lot more for us to learn about you and, and your experiences. Uh, but I'm particularly interested to get your opinion, especially with your um, extensive experience across the sub-region. Uh, in 2005 or six, thereabout, the uh, uh, federal uh, bank or the Central Bank of Nigeria did uh, suddenly raise the uh, capitalization uh, limit. And then you saw quite a lot of banks coming together, you know. Now, there's a lot of talk about that in Ghana as well. I don't know whether it's going to happen. But in the hypothetical uh, event that it did happen, what are some of the learnings that you think we ought to pay attention to from the Nigerian experience? <clears throat> Thank you so much. I mean, and that has been something, capital, capitalization has been a topic that has been trending. Mm -hmm. And it appears as if the space is getting congested with a lot of ideas. But one thing I cherish uh, is the position of the central bank governor, the bank, bank of Ghana governor, who has said, well, he has just come in and he wants to take a very good look at what is on ground before he makes a pronouncement. I, I, in my own view, we have spoken the way an economist should speak. And that is because the issue of what should be the optimum capital is not something that somebody could just wake up one day and say it should be 200 million cities, 250 million cities, 300 million cities. A lot of factors will have to be taken into consideration. One of them is the fact that you want to ensure that the banks are linked to the development of the country. And typically, where do people come from? They come from the angle of the fact that banks should, be, should have the capacity to do some amount of lending. Maybe so they consider that maybe at the current, current level of capital, mm -hmm. the I mean, Ghanaian banks, they cannot do certain size of, of, of transactions. Yes, sir. It's neither here nor there. Because the amount of capital a bank would like to hold is a function of several factors. One of them will be what segment of the market do I really want to play? Because even by the time Nigeria finishes its own, it now designated some banks, national banks, some banks, regional banks, and some banks, international banks, and then tiered the capital again. So if you are just playing nationally, obviously you don't need more than so much. And if you are going regional, 
you need so much. If you are going international, you probably need so much. Guarantee Trust Bank is an international bank with operations in the UK and in some countries, about nine or ten countries in Africa. So you can then see that it is not a question that can just be answered kind of on the top of a finger to say this is how much the capital should be. Now, apart from the business you want to run, then you also want to look at what kind of risk do I want to underwrite? Mm -hmm. What kind of loans do I want to be booking? If my focus as a bank is to look at the lower end of the market and the middle um, level of the market, which, which we call commercial bank, you suddenly realize that maybe at the current level of capital of 120 million, maybe that bank is good for it. If a bank decides to say, oh, me, I want to play in the energy sector, and I actually want to compete effectively in the energy sector, then that bank might be able to say, if a Talo needs money, if a Cosmos needs money, I should be able to be in position to be able to do it <clears throat> all alone. Therefore, I need so much of Y in, um, in capital. Now, we should also be very careful. We are all Africans. We should also, also be very careful and look at the structure of the banking industry in Ghana and ask ourselves, okay, if we want to induce a very high level of capital, what are we actually driving at? Mm -hmm. When Nigeria did it, you must realize that if there used to be, in Nigeria then there were 89 banks. By the time we reduced to 20 banks, there can only be 20 managing directors. Mm -hmm. Definitely some 70-something managing directors lost their job. We should be careful in ensuring that we don't do a policy that will backfire in reducing and in increasing the level of unemployment. That's why at times when people talk, I need to, I, 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 I usually caution, that mm. let's be very, very careful. There can only be one treasurer in a bank. And so if there are today, there are 35 or 36 treasurers in Ghanaian banks. If you induce a, a false merger and then you come back to 10 banks, you must know that, well, some 20 something treasurers will lose their job. Some of my professional colleagues who were victims of that system, of that event in Nigeria, some of them could not eventually get their acts together up till this moment. Then what again says, even if we increase capital, banks will match, what says? It's, 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 it's an industry that has evolved. And when we move capital from 60 to 120 million, a lot of the banks were able to meet up that 120 million. So whatever we want to move it to today, we can move it there. And then a lot of these banks can still meet up and we still have about 36 banks. What is most essential, which is what we are enjoying, which, 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 which is also what we should um, cherish as a nation, is financial stability. And one should give um, a commendation to the Bank of Ghana because the regulatory framework is tight, is firm, is assertive, is, is looking at the banks critically. We, Ghana is able to enjoy some level of financial stability. Mm. We don't pray for financial instability mm -hmm. because that would, could probably even be an outcome of a forced, a forced um, a major or a, an arbitrary increase in capital. Some level of financial stability is required for growth. Some level of financial stability is required for reduction in unemployment. Mm -hmm. Some level of financial stability is needed for me and you to run our lives. And you see, the economy is so connected that when you do one thing in one part of the economy, mm -hmm. it has impact on the several other parts of the economy. I'm neither against nor in support. If it comes, I'm a banker. The only thing I need to be sure is my bank is able to meet the minimum requirement. Again, let us look at the, again, the, 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 the banks operating in Ghana. Let us look at the, the kind of ownership. And that's why I kept on saying we should approach the subject with a great deal of mm. caution. You have quite a number of foreign banks and then a number of domestic banks. So whatever we are doing, therefore, we have to make sure we take into consideration. Not necessarily because we want to put um, an unlevel playing field. It must be a level playing field. But we must, we must also make sure we protect our own um, our, what we can say, our own in court, mm -hmm. to ensure that we are still able to play in the industry, rather than allowing all the gains of the industry to be going. Those are, those are honest and sincere opinion that I hold. The issue of capital is purely a research, a detailed research issue, and I'm sure the central bank is up to the task. They will do a thorough research, and at the appropriate time, they will come up with what they think is right. Now, let's step a little away from uh, the 
core banking and then step into the CEO's office and step into the space of leadership. Uh, what are the key principles and uh, in, in managing a bank that has, you know, branches right across the country and people who you don't see all the time? How, how are you able to get your leaders who are supporting you to um, get the job done? Ishra, thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's, that's a very good question. And it will take us into the realm of leadership per se, not necessarily mm -hmm. because somebody is running a bank, no. or maybe I'm running a bank. We should start by realizing that the power of a leader, the strength of a leader is in followership. Take followership out of leadership. Leadership is empty. So the first thing a good leader must do, which I do, is to give recognition to the fact that my followership, they are my strength. And it's like, if you pick a leader who has not done that, such a leader will be like a broomstick. And when you take a broomstick and you bend it, 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 it breaks. But if you have followership who are, in, who are in sync with leadership, it will be like a broom. When you take a broom and you attempt to bend it, it doesn't, it doesn't break. That is the very first rule. The next thing, is to engender trust. Because the man that will lead you, you must trust him. If he doesn't present himself as a trusted fellow, chances are that leadership and followership, there will be a break. Okay, so as a leader, you must be honest. Your integrity must be unassailable, such that your people are able to have that confidence in you that at any point in time, you can take the right decision. Trust does not emanate from knowledge alone or from position alone. Mm -hmm. Trust emanates from, it permeates all spheres. Even the way you present yourself as a human being must engender the fact that there's, a confi there's confidence in followers. People will say, okay, yeah, I think this is my leader and I'm ready to follow him. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, it's only on that that you can buy, you, you cannot build knowledge. The familiar talk is in the dark, let the man who holds the torch lead. Right? Touch in leadership is knowledge. A good leader must have superior knowledge. Right? But what most people don't also realize is that leader, a, a leader learns a lot from followers. Mm. You, you learn a lot from followers because when you, a leader must have that listening capability. If you listen a lot as a leader, you will learn a lot, both in technical sense and in other spheres of um, relationship. There's, a, there's also a, 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 um, another important um, value is friendship. You, uh, your, your, the, 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 the followership must see the leader as a friend. Even though he's the boss, they must also see him as a friend. If you, as a leader, you raise yourself so high and the relationship is not friendly. I'm seated here now. I have managers in Tamale. I have in Kumasi. I have in Takuradi. And these are people I can tell you, without seeing them, I can tell you, this is what this man will do. And I can bet it. And that is when they hear my voice, they believe so, okay, the boss is speaking. Let us listen to him. Because I've, I've developed a kind of a friendship with them. I know practically, most of them, I don't know their family in person, but I have whatever is adequate information on their own personal lives. When you take interest in the personal lives of people, they, they will tend to, in return, whatever you want to get, you must give as a leader. If you don't give, you cannot get. That is, that is, that is the irony of life. Power emanates not because you occupy a position. Power emanates because of the way you carry yourself. Mm -hmm. And the way you carry yourself have to be dominated by humility. Okay? If your approach in, is to always shout, bash instructions out, well, when people see you and you are there, they will do. But what about when you are not there? How would they then conduct themselves? But if the relationship has been, you know what? I trust you. I've given you this responsibility. This branch or this region is in your hands. On a monthly basis, you come back and give me feedback. Trust has been given to you. Definitely, it will happen. Somebody has posted me to Ghana. I report to somebody in Nigeria who is my own boss. And it's exactly the same kind of relationship. Fortunately, again, I found myself in Ghana Trust Bank, mm -hmm. where we actually relate like colleagues, like P 
peer, a peer group. We, we relate very well. You, in fact, when I sit down at times among my peers, among my staff, you might not even know this the MD because I, I will just make sure I'm, I'm able to to blend within the within the group. So those are some of the basic qualities that has driven me so far. I'm not going. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm perfect. Okay, because for every human being, there will be one error of judgment, misjudgment, or the other. But what I aspire, aspire to do each day when I get home is to review my day. Mm. What do I think I've done right? What do, I have to, what do I think I've done wrong? Those I think I've done wrong, I've learned a lesson. And I know that, okay, maybe in future, I'm not going to, to do them again. Those I've done right, as okay, these ones, they are right. Then, you see, in leadership also, you learn from experience. Mm -hmm. You do certain things today, they work. You do some things tomorrow, you know, they don't work. You also have to respect culture. Particularly for people like us, I'm a Nigerian, and I found myself in Ghana. When I was in Gambia, it was a different story. And if you find yourself in an environment, you must respect the culture of that environment. Even within Nigeria as a country, there are several tribes. Mm -hmm. We have different cultures and different attitudes to life and everything. What is most essential is certain things are sacrosanct. Truth is sacrosanct, irrespective of anybody's culture. Mm -hmm. Truth is sacrosanct. Honesty is sacrosanct. Hard work is sacrosanct. And several other things like that. Fantastic stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. then as we wrap up, um, let's get to know what you do in your spare time. In my spare time, I, because of the nature of my job, I spend most time with my family. I try to make sure well, whatever time is available, I just generally just loaf around with the boys. I have three boys and a girl, and just generally just enjoy, enjoy my spare time mm. with them. Because like, the job is like seven days a week. Then I do a lot of readings, but one thing I don't miss is my exercise. Wonderful. Exercise seven days a week. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much. It's been uh, wonderful having you on the Executive Lounge, and we're very grateful for your time. Okay. Uh, we have a tradition, uh, which is to bring five takeaways from this conversation to our viewers. And uh, the very first thing is that you must have guiding values. And in Lekan's um, own, you must have uh, the values of uh, extreme hard work, the fear of God, and discipline. If you have these among others, for him, this is the bedrock, this is the cornerstone. And if you can have these, it will set you in good stead. And number two, that you must be curious in order to be able to deliver, not just to customers who are paying you money, but even to the people you work with or work for. Uh, you should be curious. You should be asking constant questions about how can I make this a better situation for somebody else? And number three is that wherever you find yourself, Remember to learn around you. Learn about the culture of the people you're with. Learn about the environment you find yourself in because things evolve and people are different depending on where you find them. So in order to be able to relate nicely with everybody, you build all of those uh, uh, important abilities to observe and learn quickly what the values and the culture is where you find yourself. And the fourth thing that I'm taking away from this conversation is that a leader is not powerful because of their position, but they're powerful because of the people who follow them. And without the followers, a leader is on a very solitary walk. So it's important that you build people around you when you find yourself in a leadership position. And these people are the ones who will make your work uh, what it's worth. And finally, that trust, humility, like two key ingredients that you must have in order to get the best out of people. It's been a wonderful time on the Executive Lounge. Until we come your way again, I'd like to say a big thank you to our friends at Villa Monticello and X-Men, and also to Kukwa Pia and the entire production team. My name is Inshira Ado, and I always say, go forward, make rain, shalom. <laughs>